Brilliant. Okay, so Wildlife Vets International and Vet CT are very similar in the fact that we both um, provide specialist advice, veterinary advice to experts, uh, to people in the field. So for us, this is um, wildlife vets and field conservationists. And um, we pass on this knowledge to them and provide them with support and occasionally with clinical expertise so that they can do their job better to save endangered species. Um, and we've been lucky to work with Matt um, to provide him this similar kind of uh, knowledge and support um, over many years. I first met Matt um, when we both, both worked in and around the Zoological Society of London and we were both picking the brains of tiger conservationists who were um, a, um, much older than us and one of that's more experienced than us, sorry. Um, and one of those was Dr John Lewis, who's WVI's founder. Um, and Matt says that John was always on hand to give sound and timely advice about tigers, a tiger and a snare or one that needed rescuing. And of course, to discuss um, the effect that diseases such as canine distemper virus, um, which emerged in the animal tiger population in the 2000s, um, would have on tiger numbers in Asia and, um, and the conservation of them, therefore. Um, Matt has gone on, has always worked um, with tigers and predominantly in Indonesia, but has gone on to work with in many other areas, including wildlife trade, human wildlife conflict, marine protected areas, communities, policies, and what's most relevant to his talk today to us um, is about One Health. Uh, it's International Tiger Day this weekend, so it's really fitting to have such an eminent tiger conservationist talking to us about a disease that would not automatically be associated with tigers, but is certainly um, has a knock on effect on their conservation, but more immediately on some very special pig species. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matt, as we particularly as we know that you're in the process of moving continent and I'll hand over to you. Thank, thank you, Lizzie, for those kind words. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Wildlife Vet National Vet CT uh, for the invitation for all of you for um, offering up your time to join today. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Is that OK? OK. So. We're currently facing three major nature related crises, uh, biodiversity loss, biodiversity loss uh, climate change, which many of us will be uh, reading with great alarm in the news right now, and also pandemics. They're all closely connected with each other. So, for example, deforestation will bring people, livestock, wildlife into closer conflict com under stressed conditions and this greatly increases the likelihood of disease spillover, particularly infectious disease spillover. And what we've seen over the past decades is that these emerging infectious disease events have significantly risen, uh, especially zoonotic ones, so ones that originate in wildlife. And something that links into this talk today is that around a similar time as uh, COVID had emerged and was beginning to spread, so if you go take your minds back to late 2019, Another infectious disease had crossed over from Europe to Asia with devastating consequences. And this is African swine fever. It's a virulent infectious disease. It's completely harmless to humans, but it's almost certainly guaranteed to cause fatality in pigs, so cystrophe. It has very high transmission rates. And since the late 2018, it's rapidly spread across Asia. So that's been enabled by high densities of domestic pigs. Uh, you have rearing of something like 60% of the world's pork uh, is reared in the Asia continent. Um, you have low biosecurity measures there, uh, widespread trade routes linked to pork consumption. And as this map shows here, that just all those little dots are showing where we've had outbreaks, uh, primarily in the domestic pigs, but also with some wild pigs. And, our concern now is, as with Europe, African swine fever may now have become endemic in Asia. And this is really important because its impacts have been devastating so far, but also may have long-term consequences. It's killed hundreds of millions of domestic pigs in Asia, either through culling or through the disease itself. 
It's um, cost the pork industry something like $250 billion, $100 billion of that has been within China alone, but perhaps much, much more. Um, but worryingly for Asia's 11 pig species, uh, the endemic pigs, uh, we've seen the virus jump from domestic pigs to wild boar, both the Suscropa, but also to the vulnerable bearded pigs, Suspavatus, uh, also to the, uh, the vulnerable Philippines warty pigs, Suspilipensis, causing die-offs in the forest. We have two critically endangered wild pig species in Asia, the pygmy hog in India, the Visian warty pig in the Philippines. And this disease raises particularly concern because these populations of these species number in the hundreds. Um, and only every month ago, we had reports of African swine fever infecting domestic pigs in the Visian area where those warty pigs are. Now, the decline of pigs is not just the pigs themselves and that loss of endemism that we might get, uh, but also the cascading impacts that it could have on um, plant communities, apex predators, also the livelihoods of millions of people that depend upon these animals. Uh, pigs are seed dispersers, they're also seed predators, so their loss is going to affect uh, forest structure, composition, regeneration in a variety of ways that we don't yet quite know. Uh, wild boars in particular, they're the principal prey species for populations of threatened uh, top predators. So the Sumatran tiger, critically endangered, Javan leopard, critically endangered, the threatened Komodo dragon as well. And so these losses of their principal prey may then result in increases in human carnivore conflict and knock-on effects on uh, rural communities who live close by to these animals. There's also additional economic and cultural impacts of rural communities. Uh, through the loss of just an important protein source that they hunt. And this would affect millions of people. So the Indonesian island of Borneo, if you look at the Dayak communities there who hunt wild pigs, particularly the wild, the bearded pig, something like up to 40 to 50% of their protein intake comes from that one species. Uh, more generally for the Vietnamese public, 70% of their meat consumption is pork. In China, 60% of their meat consumption is pork. So you can see how this can start to have impacts in different ways. So recognizing the importance of maintaining uh, vital, healthy wildlife populations, ecosystems, and the profound impact that a disease like ASF can have uh, with the IUCN, uh, FAO, and WOA, we work together to develop a joint communique to draw attention to this issue and provide a set of recommendations. So what we were calling for were three things. Uh, a multi-party approach, so recognizing that ASF cannot be tackled by one ministry or organization or agency alone, uh, but it must be considered as a health, a livestock, an economic, and also a conservation issue. Uh, and that's got to, that requires a unified response and thinking through what some of the policy reforms would be needed here to get those ministries working together and those agencies. Uh, secondly, um, developing SOPs or guidelines on how best to respond. Uh, for example, uh, the need for surveillance to detect carcasses um, or dead pigs at the forest edge or in farmlands, uh, which are then tested and they're swiftly and correctly disposed of, uh, incinerated, put in body bags to stop reinfection. Uh, African swine fever can last in a wild boar carcass for a couple of months. Uh, so the chances of reinfection could be quite high unless they're properly removed. But also thinking about biosecurity measures, what I've mentioned earlier, to prevent that transmission. So the pygmy hog conservation program in Assam, India, is a really nice example of uh, how they're being proactive. So they're captive breeding um, this critically endangered endemic pig. They put very strict measures in place, uh, such as um, reducing the number of vehicles, people coming in, disinfecting all of those, plus food as well. Um, and this should really apply to domestic pigs, also uh, thinking about animal welfare within this. And thirdly, just collaboration. So again, as mentioned, no, no one agency can tackle ASF alone. There's the need to share budgets for investigations or for testing or disposal of carcasses, but also raising awareness in airports, seaports, along transportation routes, and that would bring in other uh, sectors as well. And I guess thinking ahead, just the need to develop a vaccine, which I'll come on later, but at the time, there was no vaccine when we were really thinking about this in um, early 2020. So having spent several years now, so 
past three years plus um, trying to respond to this, uh, trying to think through um, what the impacts of ASF are. Just wanted to share a few of our, our lessons learned. And I, I guess the first one is an obvious one, but it really is important to point out that preventing pandemics at the source is key rather than subsequently trying to control an infectious disease that has rapidly spread across uh, an entire continent and caused devastation. Um, I think raising awareness is something that's really key with these types of diseases. Uh, our government partners have so many competing priorities for their time, for their money, for their attention, uh, not just on diseases. However, at the time that ASF was spreading across Asia, uh, we had concerns on lumpy skin disease and domestic cattle, but also wild cattle like Banteng. Uh, there was avian flu outbreak had occurred. Uh, monkeypox was um, emerging in several parts. Uh, and of course, we had COVID, uh, which was uh, rightly so um, redirecting a lot of the resources and attention. And so against this backdrop of competing diseases, in a sense, what we need to do is to really demonstrate the impact that ASF is having. So I mentioned earlier, hundreds of millions of pigs, $250 billion worth uh, of economic losses. Um, you know, you also had something like quarter of a million jobs lost in Vietnam because of the impact on the pork industry. And the mass pig die-offs we have in the forest, we really struggled to find photographs showing all of this, documenting this. And so you can see these three photos here along the bottom of single dead pigs in a river or somewhere in the forest. It, it doesn't really shout out that this is a, uh, pandemic and this is something that poses real extinction risk which it does to wild pigs or to loss of a prey species to Sumatran tigers uh, but yet this is all we have um, so that's something that we were not able to convince government partners so strongly about without having that kind of documentation I think another thing is when the outbreak happened we had a lot of increased dialogue across disciplines uh, I'm a conservation practitioner. Uh, I think a lot of you on this call are pleased to know that one of the things that was most beneficial to me was talking to vets. So wildlife vets from WCS and other organizations, uh, livestock vets uh, working for WARA or FAO, really increased my understanding of how ASF works, uh, some of the strategies that have been tried before, particularly in Europe, but have failed, uh, and then just testing other ideas with these types of colleagues. Like, if we had a vaccine, could we vaccinate pigs, release them into the forest and start to repopulate that way? Um, again, through this dialogue, we had some of our partners like FAO, WOA, were really thinking about the pork industry, um, uh, livestock rearing around domestic pigs. I work for, I'm part of the IUCN Wild Pig Specialist Group as well. And, you know, we were thinking about the wild pigs and coming together, you know, we could start to share knowledge, raise awareness of the, the uh, interconnectedness of this and start thinking through shared solutions. Um, and I think a lot of this really just touches on one health in terms of this is what you need to do is take a real comprehensive approach to dealing with something like this and the partnerships that are needed as well. And I just wanted to give a, a, a couple of short examples of how us coming together through these collaborations really provided a large number of benefits. So. Um, one of the examples, this is uh, uh, the Wild Health Net Initiative. Uh, it's funded by the US Department of Defense. And um, many networks for wildlife health surveillance were through this project developed in Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. And the efforts of these networks became really important because they led to the first discovery of ASF or in wild pigs in Southeast Asia. Uh, very little is known uh, about the role that wild pigs play in the persistence and the transmission of this virus across the Asia region. Uh, and surveillance also, surveillance very limited. So we have um, just a lack of detection data, uh, which is a challenge for many viruses, uh, not just ASF, but particularly one that uh, was constraining us in terms of our response. Uh, but through the, the direct cooperation between animal health and the environmental sectors and then the engagement also with rural communities, you know, we started to fill those critical knowledge gaps. And a really nice example is provided um, here. So small pig rearing, so backyard pigs, uh, is common practice uh, across uh, many Asian countries and rural areas. Uh, there's little or no biosecurity measures. Uh, and so that really proposes a, proposes a disease risk, a transmission between 
domestic pigs to wild pigs, but also wild pigs to domestic pigs. And there's a transmission chain there. So here in Lao, working with WOA um, and also with um, AVSF, so agronomists and vegetarians without borders, what we started to do was um, characterize and quantify the interface of ASF between domestic and wild pigs around a natural park, Nama Fului, in Lao, uh, where it had been detected. This brought together livestock officers, uh, village veterinary workers, forest rangers, uh, who are now collaborating, scaling up surveillance um, and other initiatives to mitigate spillover in these areas. Again, using something, a tool called Smart Health that some of you may be familiar with, but demonstrating how that uh, could be really useful in these types of situations. Um, and more broadly for the region, we've, we've now set up a working group that brings in a whole range of partners. So with IUCN, WCN, well, uh, FAO, Mandai Nature, Singapore Zoo, um, a um, uh, epidemiology school in the Netherlands, um, anthropologists, communications experts to start to think through what a, a theory of change should be for tackling ASF and uh, what would be the required responses and really thinking outside of the box in terms of uh, not just making this a conservation issue, but it could be a communication issue, raising awareness, or it could be a um, uh, require epidemiological mapping or, or things like that. So that's something that's just started a couple of months ago. Um, and I mentioned about surveillance being important and also just a, a, a lack of information being a hindrance to us. So here in this slide, you'll see that we've been looking at how novel, low cost, uh, and replicable data mining techniques that use non-traditional data, but that are also publicly available, um, can be used uh, to fill in some of these knowledge gaps in surveillance. So the, the data that you see here, they can be used to predict the presence of spatial temporal spreads of the disease uh, across wild pig range dates. And this is an example from Indonesia that WCS has been working on. Uh, what we've done is compiled online media reports on ASF from 2019 when there was the outbreak uh, up until uh, 2022. Uh, this map here shows the, the outbreaks for domestic pigs. So starting with purple, you see the outbreak first occurred in North Sumatra, blue then spread down Sumatra, Java, across to East New uh, and then the disease started to spread north across the islands. And so you can see that there's quite a few points there that have been picked up just for using a, a readily available data set. Uh, we also did the same type of analysis looking for reports of wild pigs. I mean, what jumps out is that there's much fewer data points. And I think that what highlights is the, the limitation with this type of data source uh, and what we're missing. Journalists, for example, will live in urban areas or semi-urban areas. They won't be living in the, the rural forest edge areas where you might be detecting some of these wild pig deaths. Uh, they're less visible wild pig deaths. They may occur deep into the forest, like uh, with bearded pigs. Uh, so there's a lot of underreporting that goes on there. But I think as the Cambodia, Lao, Vietnam example showed in terms of that transmission between the backyard pigs and the forest pigs, uh, having all these types of data sources start to give us an idea of areas that are at risk and that are vulnerable. Um, and it's probably one of the best data sets that we can have because it's also near in near real time as well. So many of these reports would have been made one or two days before they were detected. And I don't know uh, a better system that exists than that. Um, but when we bring it together, you can look at some of the hot spots of where uh, ASF was breaking out across Indonesia. You get a sense that it's it's it's. Uh, uh, bad, but you don't really get any kind of qualitative feeling in terms of what the impact could be there. These are essentially just points on a map. Um, so something that we did also was to go and interview farmers or plantation workers uh, from these areas to try and understand what one of these data points would look like on a map. And so here's one. Uh, when I was in uh, around a national park in southern Sumatra, and one of the farmers said to me in late 2021, we, him and his uh, uh, farming colleagues, found 50 dead pigs. So these would be Suscroca wild boar, uh, dead by a river in the forest. Uh, and then since then, no pigs have entered our farmland. And that was six, seven months after 
he, he told me about that story and said, normally pigs would be coming into his farmland every single night. Uh, you know, you start to get uh, an impression in terms of how severe that impact is. Uh, here's another one that we picked up through one of our colleagues who is working in East Kalimantan. This is the timber plantain work, timber plantation worker. Uh, the stench of rotting bearded pigs was disgusting. It lasted for days as we cleared hundreds of pig carcasses at the forest edge. Again, when it comes back to awareness raising, trying to impress upon our colleagues how much of a priority this is and the impacts that we are having. I think these are the types of stories uh, coupled with photographs that could really uh, draw greater attention and elicit a greater response to this. I mentioned a, a, a One Health approach. I mean, I think very much advocate this for many of these infectious diseases that we work on uh, across the world. Um, it, it reminds me, again, maybe something to give us hope uh, of how the Spanish government in 1995 eradicated ASF from the entire country. And it was using something along these lines in terms of um, it's, it's, it's integrated and comprehensive way of tackling the disease. They set up mobile vet units uh, for diagnosis, also disease control. They greatly increased the testing of animals, of wild pigs, also of domestic pigs in particular. Uh, they increased hygiene and infrastructure measures uh, where domestic pigs were being kept in these animal holding facilities. So they started to segregate the animals with fences, uh, disposal of manure, really to try and break any chances of this being transmission of ASF between individuals or groups within that population. And they had swift and preventative culling when there were suspected cases of ASF uh, and also using good science, a uh, data-driven approach to map out the spread of the disease and uh, use that to guide where to have their intervention strategy. And it worked, uh, but it also took a lot of money and it also took a huge amount of effort to do that. You know, think back to that map of the Asia continent and all those points around where you need to have a similar type of response, um, and particularly in countries where there's uh, lower level biosecurity measures. I mean, there's a lot of challenges. So some of the key questions that are, are facing us in Asia, and these are the things that we're thinking through now through that working group that I mentioned earlier that we'll start to formulate our responses for. So it, it is African swine fever now endemic in Asia, like it is in uh, Europe? And if so, what does that mean for the conservation of wild pigs, for their predators that I've mentioned, for the nutrition of rural communities who are living in poverty or where we have concerns about child stunting, for example? Um, if the pork industry starts to go through these boom bust cycles as well, the economic impact that could have uh, and just those, those impacts on the, on the wild pig populations as well. Um, Although our, our media monitoring provided data points of where outbreaks were, you certainly saw from those uh, limited number of interviews that we did, and we have many more stories like that, um, the severity and the high concern around the, the conservation status of many of these pigs and whether we should start to think through um, reassessing the red list status of uh, the bearded pig, for example, it's vulnerable, but should it now be moved up to endangered or even critically endangered? And could we gather enough information to make a case for that? Um, even just high, high concerns around something like the critically endangered Vissian warty pig, where nearby uh, domestic pigs have been uh, found uh, infected with ASF. So this is something that we'll start to look into, think about reassessing as well. Uh, Concern about other species, maybe knock on effects, uh, is communities who 40 to 50% of their protein source comes from wild pigs, like the Dyaks in some of the communities in Borneo. Well, if that protein source is removed, as in they're no longer detecting pigs in the forest, do they switch their hunting to deer? Do they switch their hunting to primates or squirrels or birds? And uh, what would the impacts be there on seed dispersers or pollinators or even just species that are already uh, threatened on the red list? We're also seeing uh, outbreaks of uh, African swine fever in Haiti and the Dominican Republic have so now taken us over to the Caribbean area. I mean, if that disease then jumps over to mainland Latin America, Visa America, or even down to South America, I don't necessarily have concerns about the peccary species there. Evolutionally, they're quite distinct, so I don't think that they would be 
vulnerable, but you might start to lose your backyard pigs, your pork industry, and you might then have knock-on effects with increased hunting of wild animals uh, in that area. Um, thinking about uh, preparedness, so um, I do feel that we're unprepared. When African swine fever broke out in Asia, it's something that none of us had any experience for. There was obviously concerns, lockdown, working at home with COVID and everything else that really limited our ability to do that much. But yet, what we did find was bringing together experts, so IUCN, FAO, WOA, many, many others, uh, working with uh, livestock vets and wildlife vets uh, and thinking through what our responses could be. You certainly provided huge benefits and led to setting up ad hoc working groups that have now become formal advisory groups or working groups. I, I was until recently sitting on an FAO um, WOA advisory group for African swine fever. They have now formulated institutional strategies and action plans and put funds towards those. And this is the type of thing uh, that's going to make a real difference as we think through um, how we do respond. Some of the good news is that. Uh, as of three days ago, uh, the US government working with the Vietnamese government has just completed the first trials of a vaccine for African swine fever with an efficacy of over 90%, uh, they're saying. Uh, the US government's also been working with the Haitian government, I believe, and uh, have provided some several million dollars for them to start rolling out uh, and testing a vaccine there. So if you compare that to, and we talk about preventing pandemic rather than controlling them, if it's cost two million to prevent ASF outbreaks in Haiti and spreading elsewhere, and you compare that to the impact on the pork industry in Asia of $250 billion through trying to control once the disease has spread, it's certainly something that uh, gives us much greater hope of what we could uh, think about uh, looking into more as our response strategy. And although it seems quite gloomy in terms of uh, the impact that ASF has had, uh, there are some causes for optimism. So in uh, early this year, I was in Sumatra, and as we're driving out of a, one of our forest farming communities, a, a wild boar ran across the road and ran into a farmland and then ran back into the forest. It hasn't been something that we'd seen much of over the past years. And so, you know, nature will always find a way to bounce back and recover. But I think one of the things that hope I've impressed upon you in this presentation is that preventing pandemics at the source really is key. Uh, thank you very much.